Weight loss, isn't it frustrating? <laughs> A thin man on the front row says, no. <laughs> There's always one in the crowd. I, I always have a bit of a challenge <clears throat> since my own uh, journey has been uh, such a challenge. Overweight. Obesity is taking over our country. <clears throat> we all get heavier as we get older because there's a lot more information in our heads. <laughs> so I'm not fat, I'm just really intelligent and my head couldn't hold any more so it started filling the rest of me. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Uh, a little humor, I guess that's supposed to be our friend Garfield, uh, who always seems to have just a little bit of uh, interesting uh, twist on life. Practical weight loss is the title of our talk today. How do we go about losing weight? There are so many ideas. Uh, the little radio ad with, uh, I guess, crash and burn sort of a thing. A crash diet seemed to be a favorite. Uh, there are a lot of others as well. As I'm going to spend a little time, number one, talking to you about how to lose weight in a practical sort of a way. It'll seem a little impractical at first. That's okay. It, it should come out okay. And then I'd like to be able to open up for some questions. So you will have the opportunity to ask me uh, some questions, uh, maybe about some diet you have or whatever the concerns may be. Uh, I enjoy uh, interacting with you and hope that you find the experience uh, a fun one as well. America is overweight. This is uh, from a U.S. News and World Report, June 2002. It's easily up to uh, about one-third now of uh, adults are obese by the time they reach their mid-30s, about twice the rate of the 1960s, and it's now uh, two-thirds of adults are either overweight or obese. So we're a large nation. We have been, if you don't mind, supersized. Just eating more, exercising less, and it ends up making us uh, a very large nation. Now, how do we define what obesity is? Do you know that the scales can lie to you? Yes, she says. <clears throat> yeah, scales may very well lie to us. How does the how do scientists decide whether when they, we say that the population, two-thirds are overweight or obese, how do we do that? We do it with something called the body mass index. Maybe you've heard of this. Body mass index is, is a calculation that takes into account something besides your scales. If I tell you I have a friend who weighs 210 pounds, what can you tell me about that person's uh, weight status? Are they overweight? Are they obese? We don't know. Why? What? Ah, if that person is five foot two, that's obese. If they're six foot seven, that's skinny, isn't it? Okay. <laughs> so yes, height has to come into the whole calculation, and we use a, a calculation called the body mass index, which takes the weight in kilograms. How many of you weigh in kilograms? There are some people on the other side of the pond and around the world who do weigh in kilograms, but you and I aren't used to that, okay? If, if uh, I were to say my weight is 65 kilos, that may sound pretty good, right? But uh, if I double that and it's 2.2 times, right, that would be... 65, that would be 140 plus, so it's about 150 pounds, isn't it? So it may sound better to say it in kilograms. Instead of saying I'm 200 pounds, to say I'm 90 kilos may feel a little better, but I think we'd get used to it. Now, I really get into trouble with this feel good when we start defining height in meters, right? If I'm 1.8 meters, that really sounds short to me. I, I like five foot seven a little bit better, okay? <clears throat> so here it's the weight in kilograms divided by the height in meters squared, and that number comes out if it's in the 25 to 30 range, we say a person is 
overweight. If it goes above 30, we say that's obesity. Is it always right? No, it's not. When I was working at uh, Loma Linda University, the Center for Health Promotion, we had nearby a military base. And there were soldiers in the military whose job it was to, uh, of course, work out, be strong. They had certain rules. If you're high, this high, you can only weigh this much. And occasionally, a soldier would be this high and weigh more than that. And they would penalize him. He was passed up for promotion. I mean, there were, there were problems that could happen to his career. Well, of course, these fellows are really working out a lot. And you know, if you stop to think about it, that the muscle weighs more than the fat does. So these gentlemen could challenge that ruling. And they would be sent to where I worked. And we had a dunk tank. I don't know whether you've ever seen one of these. Kind of a, about eight foot square and about six or seven feet deep. Well, it couldn't have been seven feet, it's probably six feet deep. And <clears throat> it was full of water. We'd have these fellas stand and they'd get weighed in the air. And then they would sit in a chair, let all their, a little sling, let all their air out and get weighed underwater. And because fat tends to float and muscle and bone tend to sink, from that we could calculate their percent body fat. And often these gentlemen <clears throat> were not overweight or obese at all. They were just really strong muscle-wise. You see, the scales can lie to us, can't they? We often look at the scale to see the pounds, and there's some other things that are more important. We'd like to know what's happening inside, wouldn't we? Well, your body mass index, what is it? Wow. Well, this is the way it works. Uh, first, you take your height in inches, and I'm five foot seven. And then you go across till you see your weight. And this morning it was 157. So my body mass index is just between 24 and 25. See how that works? Height in inches, across till you found your pounds, and then up for your body mass index. You might want to have a little look at that. I'll give you just a couple of minutes. It, or a couple of minutes, maybe 30 seconds or so to kind of look your way through it if you'd like to know where you are. You know, the title of this lecture was Practical Weight Loss. Have you heard anything practical yet at all? <laughs> Me either. <laughs> Let's get on to the interesting part. At least you can decide whether you're overweight or obese or however that fits. Uh, <clears throat> it kind of spreads out there on the right. We don't want to... Uh, hurt anybody's feelings here, but that's how scientists define overweight and obesity. Between 25 and 30 is overweight, above 30 is obese. Okay, now let's try something a little more practical. In order to uh, help us understand, I'm going to introduce you to a couple of my friends. Meet Abe and Bill. Both of these gentlemen are obese and both need to lose weight. I'm sorry, it's my cell phone. <laughs> so here's Abe and Bill. They have, uh, they're overweight and they need to lose weight. They know that. As a matter of fact, they're more than just overweight. They're obese. And let me show you because you need to know what's inside, right? Both Abe and Bill are 50% what we call lean body mass. Lean body mass is muscle, bone, and water. And 50% of Abe and Bill is adiposity. Have you heard this term before? <clears throat> this is a technical term, and what it really means is... Uh, you saw it, and it disappeared. I don't like this word. <laughs> you see, when I was young, <clears throat> I was the short, fat kid in class. It just wasn't good. One day... I was with my family at the swimming pool. Now, some of you may not know this, but short, fat kids don't do a lot of things better than other kids. Unless we're at the swimming pool. And at the swimming pool, short, fat kids do some things that are a little better than skinny kids. 
Float, okay, that works. I was thinking more along the cherry bomb. Oh, you know, yeah. Up off the diving board, grab the knee and go back into the water just right, and the water goes kaboom and it splashes everywhere. Well, I could do that better than the other kids. <laughs> so I enjoy doing it. <laughs> And you know, when I got to the swimming pool, I would go to the diving board, look around at my friends, go to the end and bounce and jump off and down into the water and kaboom and splash it would go. And oh, that felt good. It gave me a feeling of satisfaction, like, like I could do something better than the other kids. Uh, that made me feel good. And of course, I would make the splash and then I would head for the ladder. And then I would go from the ladder around to the diving board again and then back up to jump again because I wanted that good feeling again. And the next one might be a cannonball or it might be a cherry bomb that was aimed at somebody way over the... You understand? It was very interesting. I discovered that the second time did not leave me with as much pleasure as the first time which meant in order for me to get that pleasure back up, I had to be faster, right, <laughs> to get around. And, and so I would race back and forth, back and around and around just to splash. And I was headed up the ladder. It was a new kid there at the swimming pool that I hadn't seen before. We were about the same age, but I was bigger. <laughs> and we got to the ladder at the same time. I put my arm across and put my elbow out, and I pushed him out of the way, and I was going up first. I was going up first because I needed to get to the diving board so I could feel good about myself again. And as I went out of the water, bathing suit dripping behind me, that kid shot a dart right at me, went right into my heart. He said, fat lump. Now fat I'd been called, but fat lump, that was something new. I didn't make it past the corner of the swimming pool. At the corner of the swimming pool, my eyes filled with tears, and, and I went to find my dad, and my dad wasn't all that thin. <clears throat> I said, Dad, he called me Fat Lump. And my father said, that's pretty cute. I haven't heard that before. <clears throat> I have never liked that word fat. <clears throat> Could we, for the emotional impact of it, choose another one. <laughs> now, fluff, that sounds like a comfortable grandma, okay? This does not have the same emotional impact as that other three-letter word, okay? So, with your permission, I would like to call this stuff fluff, okay? So here they are, Abe and Bill, 50% muscle, water, bone, and 50% fluff. And they need to lose some of that fluff, and Abe goes on a crash diet. It's called the grapefruit diet. And you know, that's around here, that's a great one. I mean, if you've got a grapefruit tree, it's free, right? What does a case of grapefruit cost in season? Not bad. So Abe gets his case of grapefruit. He's gained a little weight over the holiday, New Year's resolution. I mean, Florida, it just fits, doesn't it? That's grapefruit season, so it's done for a reason. On to the grapefruit he goes, and a month later, he's getting a little tired of grapefruit, but he's very pleased with what has happened to his body, for he has lost a grand total of... 20 pounds, his clothes feel looser, his step is lighter, and he is feeling good. Bill, on the other hand, decided that he was going to lose weight. And he went, hmm, you know, downstairs there's a program tonight about the CHIP program. Have you ever heard of that? CHIP program. He went to a CHIP program. He did some research on that. And he said, by this must be the way to go. He exercised. He ate a whole bunch of whole food plants, fruits, vegetables, whole grain rice, all that kind of stuff. And he was feeling pretty good about himself, too. A month later, Bill has lost a grand total of, on his plant-based diet and exercise, he's lost seven pounds. Feeling pretty good about himself. Until one morning, it was a Wednesday, in 
Main, on Main Street, in front of the barber shop, Bill runs into Abe. Haven't seen each other for a while. Abe, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing great, Abe says. Uh, Bill says, looks like you've lost some weight. Boy, I sure have. How did you do it, Bill says. Abe says, I, well, I did it with a grapefruit diet. I'm down 20 pounds. I feel great. It works for me every year. It's good. <laughs> Bill, now I was beginning to worry, uh, 20 pounds lost, and poor Bill has only lost 7 pounds. Are you sure he made the right decision? Uh, well, uh, Bill, you look pretty good too. Uh, how did you lose? Well, it's that uh, chip program. I've been eating plants and exercising. Well, yeah, grapefruit are plants too, I guess. Uh, <coughs> Well, Bill's a little concerned, but remember, the scales can lie to us. What do you really want to know? What do you really want to know? How much fluff? How much fluff? Thank you. <laughs> she corrected herself. <laughs> how much fluff is really there? It's how much fluff they lost that really matters, isn't it? So let's have a look inside and see past what the scales say. And there you see it. It goes something like this. When you go on a crash diet like Abe did, you lose about 50% muscle and 50% fluff. Well, that's great for the scales. That's 20 pounds down. But notice there's also less of the muscle in Abe's body. What happens when the crash diet is over? You know you can't live forever on a crash diet. It's got to have an end. If he goes back to eating the same way he was, the weight will go right back up. And he'll have more, have more fluff than muscle. And he'll have more fluff than ever. Each pound of muscle burns between 35 and 50 calories a day just sitting. I'm not talking about the exercise. I'm talking about sitting. Okay? Lying in bed. <laughs> Doing nothing. 35 to 50 calories a day just sitting there. Fluff, on the other hand, each pound burns between two and three calories a day. Not very much. So he has lost, Abe has lost calorie burning, and when he goes back at the end of that month on his regular diet, the weight tends to go right back up. Indeed, another month later, and he'll have, he'll have gained it back plus some. How many Americans live this way? Crash diet, gain it back, and more. Crash diet, gain it back, crash diet, gain it back. We call this the rhythm method of girth control. <laughs> and it doesn't work either. <laughs> As a matter of fact, the science tells us that if you do this up and down, your health is worse off than if you'd never lost the weight in the first place. <clears throat> Really need to get it off and keep it off. Now, Bill has chosen a different sort of a way. His diet is high in fiber. Fiber has no calories. By definition, you put it in here and it comes out there. Which means you can be filled up without having a bunch of calories. Uh, he's been exercising. And as he's exercising, his uh, muscles are staying strong. Now, to be technically correct, there may be a slight downward drift a little bit, but it won't be nearly as bad as it was for Abe. If you look at the squares, and I drew it this way on purpose, the amount of fluff that was lost in both of them was about the same. But because there was not a muscle loss in Bill, the scales are saying something that may not look quite as good. I heard this just a couple of weeks ago. I'm not losing any weight, but my clothes are feeling looser, okay? That is, the fluff was leaving, the muscle was staying, maybe even increasing a little bit, especially since this person had been very sedentary and was now doing some regular exercise. So, Bill has chosen the wise way to lose weight. Now, <clears throat> The best rate at which to lose weight is long and slow and gradual, about one to 
two pounds a week at the most. You don't want to do the crash. It needs to be long and slow and gradual. If you go on a plant-based diet with regular exercise, your weight can head down slowly. One pound a week, that's 50 pounds a year, isn't it? Uh, taking two weeks off, one for Christmas and one for your birthday, right? <laughs> so if I weigh 300 pounds, it takes, we're, we Americans, we want now, right? If I weigh 300 pounds, one year, 250 pounds, right? The second year, 200 pounds. The third year, 150. The fourth year, 100. The fifth year, 50. <laughs> it doesn't quite work that way. The closer you get to your ideal body weight, the harder the weight comes off, okay? And you tend to level off. I know you are beginning to worry about it. It doesn't work that way, okay? So, <clears throat> Abe and Bill have done their, uh, their weight loss, and Bill has chosen the wiser way. He's keeping his muscle up. I decided to leave medical practice and to go back to school. Now, that's an interesting adventure, if you'd like to try it sometime. Um, I went from the boss to sitting as a student, right? Uh, that wasn't so bad. The hard part was what happened to my pocketbook. And I noticed it was empty and tuition cost money. And so I went, I, I was at the university and I went to the family practice department. I knew the, uh, the, the chairman, he, he and I had been to school together and, and uh, been to residency together. And I said, could I work uh, for a little bit of pocket change? And they said, sure, you choose your hours, we'll find a spot for you. And they all knew that I was going to do a master's of public health and nutrition. And I was interested in nutrition and lifestyle things. And so anytime they had a problem that needed a little bit of insight from the doctor on nutrition and lifestyle, they would refer the patient to me. One afternoon, about 2.30 or 3 o'clock, a lady came in to see me. The office practice had a weight loss program that they offered to their parent, uh, patients. It was called the... Uh, Medifast program. Have you heard of it before? Medifast program, in those days, I don't know what it is today, but in those days, the uh, folks had a choice of either 800 calories a day or 400 calories a day. They had their special little shakes to eat and they were given a little bit of salad and it just wasn't a lot, it was a little bit. This lady, I learned, as she sat down and told me her story, had decided to go on 400 calories a day. And her weight was going down. She'd lost four, five, six, seven. And now in her second weight, week, her weight was starting to go back up. One, two. Well, that's kind of scary, isn't it? Uh, you're putting all that money and effort into weight loss, and the weight is going down, and now it's going back up. And tears came to her eyes as she uh, explained this to me. Well... I'd been a doctor long enough to know why diets fail. Do you know why diets fail? It's not hard. Cheating. <laughs> so I asked some questions. I said, and what did you have for lunch today? And she told me, and it was very appropriate for her 400 calories. I said, I knew that she was not supposed to be snacking, okay? Because I knew that. But I didn't want her to feel guilty about it, so I put it in a very positive way. I said, and what did you have for your mid-morning snack? <laughs> Wasn't that a positive way to say it? She said, oh, nothing. I said, any sodas, anything? Maybe diet soda? Oh, no, she said, only water. What did you have for breakfast? She was right on target. What did you have for your uh, bedtime snack? Nothing, she said. What did you have for your... She told me everything in the last 24 hours had been right on target. And it looked to me like she was not cheating. Well, this is very confusing when your number one diagnosis doesn't show up right. So I said, would you excuse me for a minute? And she said, yes. And I stepped out of the room, went around the corner, and found the dietician in her office. I knocked on the door, stuck my head in, and said, you kindly sent me this lady. Uh, She's been on the Metafast diet, 400 calories. She's lost seven pounds. She's gained two back. I don't think she's cheating. She said, I don't either. That's why I sent her to you. I said, thanks. <laughs> so I went back to the room, and I sat down with her, and I began to ask some questions. She's five foot two. She weighs 165 pounds. 
Her sister is five foot two and weighs 220. Her mother is five foot two and weighs 215. She works as a, in a bank as a loan officer, very responsible person, responsible job. Within the last year, she has said, I'm going to take care of my health, and she quit smoking. By herself, cold turkey, she quit. In the uh, lingo of the behavior change lifestyle folks, she had what we call an internal locus of control. She wasn't waiting for other people to tell them what to do. She was taking charge of her life herself. She was well motivated. She was doing the right thing. Everything was going like it was supposed to. I, I explored some of those, how do we say it? Uh, well, fluffy people have a little different way of thinking, or may I, maybe I should better say feeling, about their food. <laughs> uh, maybe some of you are aware of this. I, I looked for clues in her. You know, there's that sense that life is not right unless the Oreos are eaten, you know, the rows are straight. <laughs> you know anything about this? There's that sense that uh, you have to see the bottom of the ice cream carton, not just a corner of it, the whole bottom has to be visualized. Uh, broken cookies don't have any calories. <laughs> have you heard these things? <laughs> you know, there's kind of ways of thinking about leftovers. Anything you eat when nobody's looking has no calories, right? <laughs> As I interacted with her, I found that her attitude towards food was not that of a fluffy person. Her attitude towards food was more like a thin person. This was very strange. I came to the end of my, what's going on? I had no idea. And I said, there's only one thing left that I can think of to do for you. I'm going to send you down to the metabolic ward for a basal metabolic rate. Now, the test is easy. No needles, okay? It's simple. Uh, what she would do, or, and what she did, as I wrote the little prescription out, she went down uh, at the scheduled time. They sat her down in her bathing suit in a fiberglass pod with a little thing to breathe in her mouth. And she sat there for about five minutes. They measured the oxygen in, the carbon dioxide out, and how much she breathed. That was one of the things why she had to be in the fiberglass kind of little pod there. They measured that, and then they were able to tell me how many calories she was burning. This is not exercising, but basal is just sitting there. Remember I said about muscle, 35 to 50 calories a day, just sitting there and uh, fluff about two to three calories per day. This is the way we measure those types of things in, uh, in people. She came back about five days later, and I opened the chart up. Now, what should a basal metabolic rate be? For an average-sized woman, it might be 1,200 or 1,500 calories. That's what one would use just sitting all day. Of course, if one sat too much, muscle would go away and it would change. But that's average of just resting or basal metabolic rate. A very overweight or obese man might have a basal metabolic rate of 3,000 or 3,200 calories a day. You see, it, it's weight lifting in order to get yourself up and move yourself from one place to another. So the heavier we are, the more muscle we have underneath, right? So the basal metabolic rate has a wide range depending on how heavy you are, how much muscle you have, and of course, to a lesser degree, how much fluff you have. I opened her chart up and there was the sheet on the, in, from the, the lab. And they said, this lady's basal metabolic rate was 400 calories a day. Oh, this lady had a genetic strength. Can we put it that way? If she had been a prisoner in Auschwitz or in a famine situation, she would have lived through that with no problem whatsoever. Her body went into an emergency mode. When there aren't enough calories, our bodies try to preserve. So we don't eat up our muscle. We don't eat up our heart. We don't eat ourselves up. We can put it that way. Burn ourselves for energy. 
Her body had gone into that emergency mode on 400 calories and dropped down to 400 calories a day to keep from burning her muscle up and her, and her had it kept her from burning her fluff as well. Wow. Not everybody has that same uh, ability. That was a very special ability that she had. It was great for times of famine, but for times of plenty, oh, it's frustrating, isn't it? We all have that same function to a greater or lesser degree. Hers was one end of the spectrum, but we all have it. When you try to go on a crash diet, your body tries to fight it. And it's harder to lose weight. It's much better. It's much easier to lose weight if we do it Bill's way and do the long, slow, gradual weight loss. Does that make sense to you? I've seen this many times. I remember uh, I worked at the Lifestyle Center of America. One of our employees was, was overweight and she really wanted to get her weight off. And I, I saw her in the gym. Every time she had an opportunity, she was trucking hard, trying to get the exercise, sweating. And I ate with her at the cafeteria or where we ate our food and she's eating like a bird. And she, I sat across from her at lunch once and, I, and she said, I, I can't understand it. I'm just not losing weight. I'm trying so hard. Well, she went to the nutritionist. The nutritionist measured how many calories she was taking. He said, you're not taking enough calories. You, if you want to lose weight, you need to increase your calories. Isn't that interesting? Crash dieting is not good. Our bodies go into emergency modes. It's this long, slow, gradual weight loss that's safest and best in the long run. Any questions? Does that make sense to you? Okay. When you're talking about, and I may not be saying this right because I haven't thought of this in a long time, but what you're talking about where your body tries to maintain your weight, is that homeostasis? She says, when your body tries to maintain its weight, is that homeostasis? And yes, that's a word we use. Our body likes to maintain homeostasis. And that balance. You may notice that when you are calorically restricted in exercising, if you're trying to lose weight, even this long, slow, gradual weight loss, you'll have maybe a week or two where you're not losing weight, and then you'll lose a little more in the next week. That's very common as your body tries to readjust that whole energy, um, energy stat, thermostat, whatever you want to call it, down a little bit. So yes, that is uh, not uncommon. So, you've learned some very imp uh, an important lesson now. Crash dieting, not good. Long, slow, gradual weight loss is the best kind. Now, let's try something else, a little different uh, uh, perspective than we've talked about yet. A little, uh, some more practical, uh, a practical perspective. Are all calories created equal? The dietitians still like to tell us this, and I hear it from physicians as well. I was glad to see, with all the evidence, finally in a medical journal, uh, a nutritionist saying, you know, calories aren't all created the same. If you understand how calories are, they're a measure of energy. If you understand which ones are more likely to be stored, and some other kind of tricks, you can help yourself lose weight. And I'd like to teach you some of those. Number one is fats are not uh, absorbed the same as proteins and uh, carbohydrates. Fats, of course, don't, fat doesn't mix with water very well. Those of you who were at the last lecture, you learned about cholesterol as the detergent, which helps fat and water come together. Fat and water don't mix. And when fat comes in, if it comes in, in and it does, in big fat globules, call them chylomicrons. If those were to dump into your blood and go to your liver, like all the other food that you eat does, it would plug up the liver and could kill you. And so, the Creator has designed our bodies so the fats that we eat, especially the long chain fatty acids, go not in our blood, but in the lymphatic system up in the back of the chest, and it's dumped into the blood just before the blood goes into the heart. So there's the most amount of blood with the very biggest blood vessels available. Then those fat globules float along through the blood until they get to blood vessels that are too small for them to go further, and they clunk in, and once they clunk in, an enzyme on their side called lipoprotein lipase 
lets, takes the fat out and puts it in the surrounding tissues. That makes it a little bit smaller and it scooches on further and then deposits some more. So you see, ladies, it's true. You don't have to eat the candy bar. You might as well apply it directly to your hips. <laughs> fat goes into, preferentially, goes into storage. Your body will really start to burn the fat when it runs out of the carbohydrate in the meal. That's when you start to burn the fat that you eat. Fat is uh, stored first, and then later your body will look for it if it runs out of carbohydrate. This helped me a whole lot. One of the foods that I had a challenge with, I don't know if you all have challenges with some foods. There are comfort foods. One of them that was very hard for me, well, two of them, as a matter of fact, ice cream, oh, <laughs> and french fries, okay? Oh, I just love french, these were my comfort foods as I was growing up, but I began to recognize they are full of fat, and that fat goes into storage, and I, that means I have to fight to get it off. And in my mind, picturing those fat globules going along through the blood vessel <laughs> and getting stuck there, and then letting that fat off has been very helpful for me, personally, as I have approached ice cream, for example. Now I say, wait a minute, that stuff is going to go into storage. No, thank you. I can get by without it. I have discovered, it's taken a few years, I have discovered that if I don't have it, I don't die. <laughs> and, you know, there's those, maybe you all have met those things, they're called do-nots. They're even named appropriately, right? <laughs> High in grease, they tend to, oh my, they're, they're real fat bombs. They tend to make us gain weight. I can put those away now. Uh, I've learned to look at them. And, and that picture of those fat globs going into storage has been a big help to me. I hope it's helpful for you too. Well, <clears throat> fat calories go into uh, storage first and are used for energy later. Here's the next little one that may be helpful for you. Carbohydrates are not all the same. There's glucose and fructose. Have you ever heard of high fructose corn syrup? Yeah. Fructose comes from fruit. That's where we discovered it. And this nice papaya over here, God put fructose in it. But what we, what we know is that fructose has one and a half times the sweetness for the same amount of sugar. And so what the industry has done is take glucose and run it past some enzymes and change it into fructose. Then they have this syrup and it's one and a half times as sweet as sugar so they can use less of it to get the same amount of sweetening. In sodas, in baked goods, all kinds of things you see this high fructose corn syrup. And in some ways it's good in small amounts. It doesn't stimulate insulin like glucose does, so it's beneficial. In large amounts, though, you've got a problem. In large amounts, fructose is much more easily changed into fluff than glucose. Uh, if you run glucose in an IV into somebody, it takes about 5,000 calories a day before the body will really start to push it over into fat. At least that's what they taught me when I was in uh, my nutritional training. But fructose, on the other hand, is two steps closer. So when we eat a whole bunch of high fructose corn syrup, we're helping to increase our weight. Best to avoid the stuff with high fructose corn syrup. A little bit, okay. But the large amounts of it get us into trouble and tend to make us gain weight. The glucose doesn't except as it stimulates insulin, but it doesn't usually provide calories for weight gain. Glycemic index. Have you ever heard of this word, glycemic index? Some of you are nodding your heads and some are not, so sure. Let me explain it to you. You see, how fast a sugar comes into your body, how fast the sugar comes in, has a lot to do with what happens to it. When sugar goes in fast, Insulin goes up because it's supposed to put the sugar away. You probably heard insulin helps put sugar away. Insulin is a growth hormone, so it tends to make you gain weight. 
One of my friends likes to tell the story about Petersville and Paulsville. Both had the same amount of rain. One town got it all on one day, and the other got it sprinkled out over all year. Right? Same number of calories, same number of drops of rain, but if it all comes on one day, you've got a flood. If it's sprinkled all over the, all day, over the year, then everything is green and nice, and there's no damage, right? And so the flood of sugar coming into our bodies can cause damage, including weight gain, increase our risk of atherosclerosis, heart disease, and those types of things. So we like it to go in slowly. Here's how we measure it. Scientists will use one of two things, either plain glucose, in a glucose solution that you drink, or white bread. Now, you wouldn't think of white bread as sugar, would you? But the scientist looks at it as the same as sugar because it may not taste sweet, but when it gets to our blood, it acts just like sugar. So many people look at the labels and it says, no sugar added. And what's in it? Highly refined flour, which goes into your body just like sugar does. So you can't just depend on your taste to know whether something is safe or not. Okay, so that's 100%, either the white bread or the sugar. Now, that's 100%. We measure the area under the curve, how much sugar goes in, how fast, over two hours or an hour and a half, whatever it is. Now, the next food is checked up against that. What would happen if I gave 100 grams of broccoli? Okay. Do you think the sugar would go up very much? Just a little bit. And the, that would be expressed as a percentage. And we would say broccoli is about, has a glycemic index of about 20%. Does that make sense? Uh, whereas something like soda pop <laughs> might be 100%, maybe even a little higher sometimes, right? So glycemic index is a way of telling us how fast the foods go in. Here's a general principle. The closer you get the food to the way God made it, the more that fiber is inside of it, the lower the glycemic index. If you eat... Uh, sugar beets, <laughs> the glycemic index is going to be lower than it is for sugar, right? Because in the plant, it's still mixed with the fiber. I, that should uh, make uh, good sense to us. Look in the picture. You see apples. How many apples can you eat before you're full? You know, maybe three, okay? Uh, turn that apple into an apple pie. <laughs> then we have a problem, don't we? Okay. There's the, yes, all the, the flour in there, the sugar that's, that the apples are put in, and the crust and all that, and you have a sugar bomb that's going to really raise the blood sugar high. It's going to be high glycemic. You notice at the top of the picture, there's the picture, it's a, one of those old glass milk bottles. Remember, I remember those being delivered to my house when I was a kid. Milk has a lot of sugar in it, but it's not sweet. How many people with diabetes have I... Uh, had his patients who, well, why is my blood sugar going up? Well, uh, tell me about the milk you're drinking. Uh, it's not, it's no sugar. I say, oh, yeah, it's sugar. It's just not sweet. Okay. It has a sugar that is not sweet in it, but it can still raise the blood sugar very nicely. So that's a good illustration. There's no fiber in animal products, so nothing to slow that sugar in. Fiber works as a little sponge to hang on to the sugar to let it go in slowly. So it would be best for us if we had low glycemic food, so we had less stimulation of the insulin, and insulin tends to make us gain weight. If we can keep the insulin down, the weight will come off easier. The second one is very similar to that, and maybe it's just a repetition of the same thing, high fiber foods. When you have high fiber foods, it fills you up and you can't eat as much. It goes in much more slowly, low glycemic. And so these vegetables that you see on the screen, wonderful as far as glycemic index is concerned, helping to keep the insulin down uh, and help us lose weight. Now I'm going to get up on a little soapbox of mine. Choosing the picture for this one was a bit of a challenge. What do you see? Some divers with <gasps> sharks. And the way I figured it was this, meal timing, how does it fit in here? If I'm going to be swimming with the sharks, I'd rather they already ate, right? <laughs> so meal timing makes a big difference, doesn't it? So here we are. <clears throat> Does it make a difference when we eat? If you're going to get on a plane here and fly to Honolulu, do you want them to put the fuel in the plane here or after you get to Honolulu? 
It just kind of makes sense, doesn't it? <laughs> okay. As you fly through your day, it makes a lot more sense to put the fuel in the plane at the beginning of the day, much more than the end. If you just eat that big meal and lay down at night, what will your body do but just store it? The study was done first by a fellow by the name of Hallberg uh, in a metabolic ward. Metabolic ward, patients come in and they do exactly what the doctor tells them to do. They eat just exactly what, <laughs> they sleep, they exercise, they have their blood drawn, they do it, kind of everything together. Metabolic ward, it's a scientific experiment, sort of an environment. You have to pay people to do it, they don't do it for fun. Almost have to go to the bathroom together, I mean, it's really strict. So he assigned these people 2,000 calories a day, either in the morning or in the evening. They were randomly assigned to one or the other. After two weeks, they were switched. If they'd been in the morning, they switched to the evening. If they'd been in the evening, they switched to the morning. So each was their own control in the scientific experiment. When the experiment was done, he demonstrated that when we eat, or when those folks eat calories in the morning, they lost significantly more weight than when they ate it in the evening. And it does make sense to us. So we're not surprised to hear that. I like to put it this way, maybe you've heard it, breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince, and supper like a pauper. Make sure that evening meal is small. What happens overnight when you have a small evening meal, or some people even choose to eliminate the evening meal? Have you ever heard of the fasting state? What do you think of when I say fasting? No eating, gnawing stomach. Some people will think religious type things, right? Uh, there's uh, Ramadan that the uh, uh, Muslims have as, as they celebrate where they, they can't eat during the day. It's kind of their fasting time. But sometimes it has a religious connotation as well. From a physiologic standpoint, though, fasting means something very definite. What it means is energy, in, when we're in the fasting state, is being taken from storage instead of from the stomach and intestines. I mean, that's just the basics. It has something to do with insulin. When insulin gets low, the body starts to look for energy from the periphery and starts to bring it in and burn it. Is that good or bad? Well, if you're heavy and you want to lose weight, that's good, <laughs> okay? If you're real thin, and then that's not good because you don't want to lose that weight. So let's call it good for our purposes here since we're talking about weight loss. So it's good if your body reaches the fasting state. It takes between 8 to 12 hours to reach the fasting state, depending on how big the meal was. So look at it this way. Breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince. Let's skip the evening meal. I mean, that sounds pretty drastic, but let's skip it. So how long before we actually reach the fasting state? The last meal was, let's say, at 12 o'clock. Maybe you finished it at 1. So that would be 8 hours later. That would be about 8. If it was a big meal, it might go as long as maybe 12. Okay? So it's 8 to 12 hours to reach the fasting state. So in the middle of the night, while you're sleeping, your body switches over from taking energy from your stomach to taking energy from storage. You're losing weight while you're sleeping. Isn't that something? And interestingly enough, that's the way it works physiologically. Our body will always use the food from the stomach in preference to the food from storage. If you go out to try to exercise your weight down, it doesn't work. <laughs> you, you know, you do the miles. It seems like all the exercise physiologists and the nutritionists who talk about this are thin, right? They don't understand what it is to be thick. Fluffy. <laughs> and our physiology is different. We tend to have higher insulin levels. And it just doesn't work the same when your insulin levels are up. But if you use this little trick, when you eat makes a difference. Breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince, supper like a pauper. Then in the middle of the night, while you're sleeping, your body has switched over its physiology and you're losing weight while you're sleeping. What a unique idea. Now, if you really want your exercise to help with the weight loss, 
than, uh, in a more direct way, then before you eat breakfast in the morning, go out and do a little exercise. Because your body is all geared up, right? To burn the energy from the periphery. After you eat, the energy will come from, your, from the food that you ate. Does it make sense? When you eat, makes a big difference. Meal timing makes a big difference. Any questions about that? Yes, sir. Going back to the uh, uh, fructose. Yes, sir. Um, with eating apple or orange. Yes, sir. I mean, we would be getting the fructose. Um, how, and then yet that will uh, be transferred. I mean, how many calories or how much? The fructose, he's asking, fructose comes if you eat an apple or a pear, or if you eat fruit, it has the fructose in it. It's a small amount of fructose for the size of the, the serving. And that is not, uh, doesn't cause any problems. It, it's true that fructose is more easily turned into fat, but there's a small amount of it, so it's not a problem. I mean, if we're eating the 7 to 9 or 7 to 11 servings of fruit and vegetables, I'm just wondering, you know, the amount then, if we're eating like 4 or 5. It's, if you're eating fruit, it's, uh, fructose is not a big problem. If you're taking stuff with high fructose corn syrup, then it's really, really concentrated. And that's a whole different story. By the way, the fructose I told you, I mentioned, and you may or may not have picked it up, it does not raise the insulin. Remember, insulin tends to make us gain weight. So if you're going to eat breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince, and supper like a pauper, it would make sense for you to have a piece of fruit in the evening because the sweetness is coming from fructose and it's much less likely to raise that insulin. It's actually one of the ideal foods for eating in the evening before you uh, go to sleep. Yes? Is it better if you're going to eat a little something in the evening and it's very small? Is it better to balance the carbohydrate with a little bit of fat and a little bit of protein? Or is it best if you're going to eat anything at all to eat carbohydrate versus fat or whatever? What's going to be the best? It's a good question. A lot of people are surprised. When you eat whole foods, you're getting a balance. People don't know, for example, that an orange, 8% of the calories are from protein. I'll bet you never thought that an orange had protein in it. Protein means for life. Anything that is alive and, and not refined is going to have the protein in it. Does it, does it make sense? So th th lettuce. 9% of the calories in lettuce are from fat. Bet you never thought lettuce was a fat food, right? <laughs> and fat is necessary for life as well. Now, I didn't say 9% of lettuce is fat. I said 9% of the calories. Most of it is fiber and water. But there is fat, there is protein even in lettuce. Yes? She says that, that the, uh, the, the whole plants don't satisfy. But not the whole, whole plant, like the fruit and the vegetable, aren't as satisfying for you. It's interesting. I've heard that before uh, and actually experienced it myself. Our bodies kind of get used to, and we have habits. And it takes uh, maybe seven to ten days to kind of get that to switch over. And when you first start a, a new uh, habit like that, it can take your body a while to adjust. I like to tell people to kind of go at it slowly. Make sure that evening meal is small and something that does okay, and then you just slowly decrease it. Our bodies are pretty smart. Um, I've discovered, you know, at six o'clock, if you're used to eating supper, if you're not eating supper, your, your brain will start to send out signals, your stomach will start to send out signals and acid, and you tend to get really hungry, and the stomach is saying, aren't you sending something down? <laughs> that's, that's kind of the response. <laughs> and if you pour down some water, uh, the next day it says the same thing, but not quite as loud. And after a week or so, it's saying, okay, I know there's nothing coming. 
And then I found that if, uh, let's say it's a Saturday night, I'm invited to somebody's home and I, I have a meal and I haven't been used to having a meal, Sunday night at 7 o'clock or whenever it was I ate, my stomach says, aren't you sending something down? <laughs> I mean, it, it learns quickly and it can be trained. Uh, there are people who uh, have hypoglycemia, that is their blood sugar tends to drop low. And that can come from just eating all the time too much. The body says, oh, it's coming and it'll drive the blood sugar down. The best treatment for it is actually to give it some of this fasting state. And then the, the pancreas is resting and it's not happening that way. I, I hope that you found that uh, somewhat helpful uh, in discussion. It's still a worthwhile thing to do if you knew, need to lose weight. If you're thin, it can be a little harder. Yes, sir? What is your recommendation regarding the concept of eating five or six small meals a day? Oh, a my, what a great question. Have you all heard that? Yeah. What about eating five or six meals a day? This came out of the 1950s, 40s and 50s. Some scientists did some work in the laboratory and discovered that if they, you know, gave people just calories throughout the day, they would actually raise the basal metabolic rate and people would burn more calories. Well, if you can burn more calories, it makes sense to try to graze, that's a word we used to talk about, it, graze through the day to keep the calories uh, that we burn up. It increases our basal metabolic rate. That worked really well when there was a uh, scientist saying, okay, here's your carrots. <laughs> okay, you know, here's your celery. But when you get out in the real world, and this is why it kind of fell out of favor, get out in the real world, the snacks that we eat are not that controlled, and it's very hard for us to quit. They advertise them. I bet you can't eat one, right? It's high fat and sugar or high salt and sugar. I mean, it just it gets kind of all mixed together, and it's very hard for us to limit. Now, when I was doing my training, I saw a bunch of skinny nutritionists running around saying that. But having my, just for my own self, it's very hard for me to stop eating. And, and indeed, in the real world, we haven't seen it work well, except for skinny nutritionists. So I don't <laughs> recommend it, and I don't find it helpful. Okay. Uh, I have a question about basic metabolic rate. Uh, when is the best time to have exercise to raise uh, basic metabolic rate? She says, when is the best time to have exercise to raise your basal metabolic rate? Is it before the meal or after the meal? Well, when you exercise, your basal metabolic rate goes up for a period of time, and it may be 6, 8, 12 hours. It, it goes up for quite some time. But you're asking as well, what about for the meal? There are benefits to exercising either before or after a meal. The one thing I would not do it be, would be to exercise very heavily right after a meal because the food in your stomach needs the blood flow. And if you exercise a lot, it'll pull the blood flow through from your stomach and kind of ruin the digestion. It can make you, you won't feel well. But moderate exercise, like taking a walk, can actually help because it decreases the amount of insulin that your body needs to make. When you exercise your muscles, the muscles can take sugar into them without insulin. So that decreases the insulin need. Insulin tends to make us gain weight, so this helps to keep our insulin levels down. Now we know that if you exercise before a meal, when you eat that meal, it, the sugar and fat both go into the cells and get put away faster. So there's benefits of being active. Uh, either before or after a meal. So I would recommend exercising, keeping active, avoid real heavy exercise <coughs> right after a meal, probably for the first hour, hour and a half. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Um, I have three kids, um, and that three times a day, how, does that, how do you apply that to kids? Well, how do you apply the breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince, supper like a pauper to kids. Well, I suppose the first question is, are your kids overweight? Um, I have one that is a little fluffy. Fluffy. <laughs> one that's fluffy. Well, that's how I grew up. And one of the things that my mother taught me was to leave off the evening meal. Now, she didn't make me leave it off, but she said, why don't you try that? And indeed, that was very helpful for me. When I got to medical school, I began to understand why, because the science was there to help me understand. So I think what you do with kids 
is uh, try to educate them, number one, and number two, try to make it easier for them. One way to do it would be to uh, not supply a big prepared meal in the evening, but make some healthy snacks available if they need them. And then, if you have activities, it's always easier for me to not eat if I'm doing something besides sitting and watching TV. You know, if we have a project or uh, getting outside to play is not something that kids do much anymore, is it? They kind of do a lot of the video games. So uh, try to uh, encourage kids to move in the right direction. I would never demand or require that anybody, you cannot have that evening meal. I think it's something that people need to choose because it makes sense to them. It'd be encouraged. It's the way I was brought up and I, I, I found it effective. And I would encourage you to do the same for your kids. And they'll learn. That you, oh, your weight's going up. Why don't you try skipping the evening meal? What can we do to help you? Now, let me know if you want help. And, and then work with them. Yes, ma'am. I have a question about the Weight Watcher program. It's all yes. based on, on points. So if you're doing your, your breakfast like the King, the King, Prince, and Pauper thing, so you just do basically a lot of points in the morning, and less in the afternoon and then just a couple in the evening. That, that's a very reasonable thing to do. If you're, if you're doing Weight Watchers and your points, adjust things so you're eating a little more earlier. We know from science that if you skip your breakfast, your next meal, you'll overeat. You don't, if you skip your lunch, your next meal, you'll overeat. Don't skip those meals. We do not have similar science on supper, okay? That is, it doesn't, that doesn't hold to be true. At least we have no proof of that. And my own personal experience is we tend to do less. You'll eat more for breakfast if you skip the meal. There's a lot of interesting changes. You sleep better. At first, there may be kind of a, a little bit of headache. Put a little water on top of it first. And, and it doesn't take very long till your body is enjoying the rest. When your stomach is empty and your intestines, that fasting state, your intestines pour out a hormone called melatonin. Have you heard of it? You sleep better when your stomach is empty and not trying to deal with energy. It's amazing. And uh, people feel better on, and have a lot more energy. Their body has a chance to repair. Nighttime is supposed to be a time for repair. If your stomach is working when it's supposed to be resting and repairing, then people will go for years never letting their stomach rest, and their bodies really feel it. Yes, ma'am. She says she's heard somewhere that uh, if you, you're going to eat fruit with a meal, better to have it at the beginning of the meal rather than the end because it digests so much quickly, more quickly. I've never seen any science on that, but it does make sense to me. And I prefer fruit, especially in the evening meal. It does digest quickly. Another thing that I have heard and experienced personally right. is that if you mix fruit and vegetables together, it tends to make you sleepy, okay? okay. And uh, I've discovered that, especially when I'm doing a lot of brain work, I really can't have fruit with that noon meal. Or if I'm trying to see patients in the afternoon, I'm, I'm just struggling to stay awake. Experiment with it yourself, and you can see how it, how it works or doesn't work. Yes, ma'am. Your metabolism, oh, I suppose, slows down a little. Uh, yes, you're going I assume you're eating adequate amounts to get good nutrition, and y <laughs> this pattern should be beneficial to help the weight loss, if that's indeed what you want. Okay? So, yes, the metabolism is going to be a little slower than if you graze, but it's very hard to control your calories if you graze. So. Overall, it's better to do, in my mind, the, the, the two meals a day. It's more effective. Yes? The small children prior to school, should they eat often? Uh, yes, the same rules do not apply to the, to the young children before school. I, um, I don't think we should restrict their eating. Kids, generally, if you feed them good quality food, will adjust their intake appropriately. It's only us older folks that tend to eat because we're mad, scared, uh, bored. 
or just deserve it, <laughs> right? <laughs> we get addicted to foods. We, we try to run around that. Remember the, the diving board? We tend to run around that with our foods. That, that addiction cycle that I experienced there on the diving board, we often have with foods, right? The chocolate feels and tastes good the first bite. The next one is not so much. I just has to go faster and faster. Potato chips, the same thing. I mean, it's an addiction cycle that we have with these, the kind of this pleasure. Okay, a couple more questions and I'm going to move on. I'm sorry? As a uh, diabetic on insulin, would you still suggest skipping supper? She says, uh, as a diabetic on insulin, would you still suggest skipping supper? Now we're getting into some real complicated areas. If the, if the newfangled insulin and the insulin is adjusted correctly, it is no problem. But if that's not the case, it is a problem. And so I would say don't do it without your doctor's help and the doctor should really understand it to make it work right because blood sugar can go too low. Yes? Um, and besides meal timing, is it better to do carbohydrates in the morning and then like fats towards the middle of the day? And she says, is it better to, be, better to have uh, carbohydrates in the morning and fats later in the day? And protein, you know, the and fats and protein, protein. okay. Protein. One, one could, uh, looking at proteins a little later for healing, what I like to tell people to do is to eat a high fiber meal. Very interesting study that looked at um, oatmeal. The breakfast was exactly the same. One was sugar frosted cornflakes. The other one was oatmeal. The very same calories. Interestingly enough, there was the same amount of sugar too because sugar had been put on the oatmeal. Okay? And then they fed that breakfast to people and they said, okay, eat what you want for the rest of the day. And they measured what they ate. The people that had the oatmeal chose 30% fewer calories than those that had the frosted cornflakes. Why? Because of the fiber in the oatmeal kind of held on through the day and they just weren't that hungry for a long time. A high fiber meal tends to stick with you a long time. One of the things we like to tell people with diabetes, if you've heard me talk about that, is eat beans for breakfast. Right? Beans are high in fiber. They stick with you. They, they, uh, they give a sense of fullness so people don't feel like they're hungry all the time. And it's a real good thing to do. I, uh, I don't think you have to separate, and I don't think it makes that much difference which order you put them in. It, I don't think it makes that much difference. Eat wise. I know some people who have like their noon meal, their dinner it, at breakfast with the vegetables and all that and then fruit later on. It's not a bad way to go. Or you could do fruit and oatmeal for breakfast or, which is fine too. Okay, there was a hand I think way back over there as well. Did it go away? Did you have a question? Oh, now you're talking about something very interesting. Uh, <clears throat> fruit, and this is fascinating, we, we can get into this. Our mood, our whole sense of well-being, uh, maybe you all have heard of serotonin. There are medications that increase the serotonin in the brain. Serotonin is made from tryptophan. Tryptophan comes in foods, beans, meat as well. Turkey is very high in turkey. <clears throat> And in order for it to get into the brain, it doesn't go just go across easily. You might expect if you eat it, it goes to the brain. It does not. It has a very active mechanism. It's de dependent on insulin to get it across into the brain. It's competitive with something called uh, other large neutral amino acids. I'm probably getting too complicated. And, <clears throat> and if you get too much of the wrong kinds of proteins, it keeps tryptophan down. If we have high fiber foods with carbohydrate, we get a low insulin throughout the day and we can get more tryptophan into your brain and you feel better. So it's fascinating. One of the reasons people overindulge on sweets is because they're not getting enough of that fiber, that long, slow release of insulin. So they take sugar in order to run their insulin up so they can get tryptophan into their brain. And it's leading to obesity. At least that's what the science is telling us. So how we feel is affected by our food. 
Now, I, we're getting close to end, and I've got just a little more to go. So I've got two more people with questions. I'm going to take these last two. I saw yours first. So I'm going to take yours first. And then uh, let's go on to some slides here. I've got a couple more things I want to share. I yes. I going to ask the high fiber foods. Does it matter if it's raw? Does it matter if high fiber food is raw or cooked? Yes, it does matter to a certain degree, but if you're eating the whole food, it's a whole lot better either way. For example, a whole apple would be better than applesauce. Okay? Um, a potato, if you try to eat it raw, <laughs> you're not going to digest very much at all, right? Not that you couldn't, but it just takes a long time. So yes, the cooking process does... It, it does change its absorbability a bit, but it doesn't change the fiber content all that much. So it's, I hope that's helpful. Yes? And maybe, Dr. Gunter, you're going to talk on this later, but talk a lot about sugar. But what about sodium? How does that impact uh, you know, weight loss? I know it has something to do with fluids, but, but and what is a good um, guideline to tell us sodium we should have? That is a whole different topic for a whole different night. <laughs> I'll tell you this. If you eat lots of fruits and vegetables, your sodium sensitivity goes away, even in the most resistant people. So stick with the uh, uh, fruits and vegetables and lots of them, and you don't have to worry so much about the salt, okay? And it doesn't have so much to do with weight. Okay, let's go on to the next one here. You've been very kind. This is proteins, the arginine lysine ratio. This is very complicated. I'll simply tell you, if you're smart enough to read it, I've got an article that may be helpful for you, okay? It goes something like this. Arginine is a branched amino acid, and our body uses it to make something called nitric oxide, or helps to relax the blood vessels, helps to fight atherosclerosis, high blood pressure, heart disease. Lysine is long and straight. There's little, by comparison, arginine in animal proteins. There's a lot more in plants. <coughs> And when you get more of the arginine compared to the lysine, for some reason you don't stimulate as much insulin and it's helpful to lose weight. What difference does that make? Here's the practice on it. Even if you move to non-fat milk, you're still stimulating the insulin more than you need to. And I would encourage you to, if you really want to lose weight, to get off dairy altogether. No fiber at all. But you experiment with that yourself. That's kind of an advanced concept and we're not here to push it down anybody's throat. Okay, now the last few minutes, I want to take you on a trip. We've talked about uh, calories. Uh, it is calories in and calories out, right? They're not all created equal. We can play little tricks on it. When we eat, it makes a difference, whether it's fat or protein or sugar, a little bit different. Uh, with the fiber, it makes a difference, but it still is choices. This is from Dr. Shapiro's Picture Perfect Weight Loss book, The Visual Program to Permanent Weight Loss. And this is a great little book to help us visually understand the, some of the choices that we have to make. What about this? Three ounces of apple chips. I find apple chips in the health food section, right? You'd expect them to be healthy. What are they? Thinly sliced apples that have been deep fried. Oops, <coughs> right? Three ounces, 460 calories, you could have had four apples and four breadsticks. Truth is, I'd have gotten through two apples. And uh, the breadsticks, of course. <laughs> One cup of cashews, equivalent to eight baked potatoes with salsa. Wow, those nuts really add up the calories fast, don't they? Yeah, choices, we've got choices. A raspberry tart, mmm, 440 calories, could have had eight cups of raspberry with some low-fat whipped topping. Choices. A scone, oh, now there's a good piece of food. I thought, now that's a good vegetarian selection. <laughs> Oops, 930 calories, could have had almost a whole loaf of raisin bread with jam for the same amount. Choices. Don't have time for breakfast, it's just going to be a bagel and cream cheese. 650 calories, could have had. Same amount of calories, four light pancakes, four vegetarian links, two tablespoons of light syrup, sliced star fruit and persimmon. Whole breakfast, same number of calories. Choices, hamburger, and it's no Whopper at 600 calories. It's only a six ounce. Could have had a Boca burger, same stuffings, add portobello mushrooms, couple slices of eggplant, Wow, what a change. You get 
almost twice as much for half the calories. Oh, yeah. I, I'm going out to eat, and uh, it's going to be a problem, but I'm going to have a salad. That'll be healthy, right? Oops. Caesar salad, 560 calories. Could have had a cup and a half of bean soup, five grain roll, mixed salad, one and a half cups of melon cubes, five ounces of sorbet, 410 calories, about two-thirds, right? Choices. <coughs> Now, I got caught on this one, which is why I put it up here on the screen. Look at it. Seven ounces of low-fat, no-salt, oat bran pretzel nuggets. I mean, this just hit all my health buttons. What about you? 800 calories. Could have had four pretzel rods, three bananas, five dates, six prunes, six apricot halves, six dried apple rings, and a partridge in a pear tree. <laughs> Fig Newton. Now, there's a good... Uh, a healthy cookie, right, with the figs and all the fiber. 60 calories, about the same as a small cantaloupe. I bet you can't eat one Fig Newton. <laughs> bet you couldn't eat the second cantaloupe. <laughs> Two ounces of cheese, 240 calories. The same number of calories as 30 dried apricot halves. Choices. Pizza. Oh, pizza's the killer. And that cheese is so high in fat. Just a cheese pizza, 450 calories per slice. If you get veggies on it and hold the cheese, try that sometime and see what happens. Oh, that must be a telephone. I thought, thought for sure there was a riot outside. <laughs> Only 250 calories. Walk into the pizza parlor sometime and ask for a pizza hold the cheese. <laughs> What? <laughs> it's actually very tasty. Don't make the same mistake I did, okay? I said, oh, this is healthy. I ate the whole pizza. <laughs> There's actually quite a bit of fat and stuff in the crust. But if you're making choices, if, if the family's going out, it's very tasty. Look at that. Take your own veggie pepperoni, hold the cheese. Calories are good. You've got a nice, tasty alternative. Now, alcohol, we really get into trouble. Alcohol is, uh, it plays a little fool on us. If we take water, there's no calories. If you add sugar in it, then we would say, and some flavoring, you would have fruit juice. And the calories would be in solution. That is, they would be dissolved in the water. When you start working with alcohol, the water, if you will, the liquid has calories. So it really adds up fast. Uh, here's a... Uh, Two and a half fluid ounces of uh, vodka, 300 calories, add a few nuts. It's, you know, it's kind of a teaser before the meal. 740 calories, almost twice, well, maybe uh, two-thirds of what the whole meal could be. See how the alcohol can really fool you? Yeah, I don't get caught on that one, and I'm sure you all are teetotalers and it doesn't matter, but it's an important lesson. Uh, cornbread, and it shouldn't be called cornbread, corn cake. There it is, uh, seven ounces, 820 calories, could have had two ears of corn uh, on the cob, roll of, uh, with jam, baked potato with salsa, sweet potato, and two slices of raisin bread for the same number of calories. We've got choices, don't we? This illustrates uh, portion size. Here's pasta, a whole bowl. Make it a smaller portion. Add a squash with some peppers and, and a portobello mushroom. And you end up significantly reducing your calories and increasing the amount of food that you're eating. It's all a matter of choices. And it is calories. Now, I got caught on this one. A whole pineapple, 200 calories. The same as two ounces of gummy bears. <laughs> And who could eat the whole pineapple? It, in general, the closer we get it to the way God made it, the better off it is. Crumb cake, 320 calories. Could have had half of a honeydew melon, uh, some mixed fruit, a little bit of sorbet on top, and a biscotto. No, it's not a chocolate one, but it's a biscotto. And uh, 320 calories. Now, just between you and me, that's the whole meal, right? It's quite a bit rather than just a little piece of dessert. So our choices make a big difference. And the closer we get it to the way God made it, the better off we are. Hero sandwich, sausage and pepper hero, 920 calories. Could have had a, a different choice here. A couple of, of uh, cups of soup with potatoes. You'd have really been full on the right, whereas on the left you may have wanted uh, frosty or something. <laughs> yeah. Chex mix. 
820 calories could have had nearly a whole loaf of semolina bread. Okay. Here's a holiday meal, 3,710 calories. I won't read it to you, but boy, that's a, it's no wonder we gain weight each holiday season if we eat that way. Another choice, lots of color, uh, lots of variety, and, and lots of volume for that matter, at significantly fewer calories, about one-third. So you see it is choices that we have to make, isn't it? Choices about what we eat are important as well. Well, our time is up. We've been at this for about an hour and a half. We've had fun. Uh, I, at least I've enjoyed it, and I, I trust you had your questions answered. Uh, nobody asked about Atkins, so I guess I'll be able to go home. I mean, he's already demonstrated himself, hasn't he? But if you got any questions, thank you. Good night.